Uh, welcome to um, our International Women's Day uh, webinar for sustainability partnerships. We've not done uh, an event specifically relating to um, women's health or done anything around International Women's Day before, but after um, going to a lot of events um, around the country recently, um, there have been a lot of uh, panels, a lot of discussions that are specifically around this topic. Um, Obviously, it's uh, it's really important to 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 me uh, as a woman that we're having these conversations. It's also important to allies like my co-founder Nathan that we're having these conversations. Um, and we have an amazing panel of people today that I'm not going to take up too much of their time so that they can share their insight and experiences with you. Um, I know that uh, the theme for International Women's Day is um, equity as opposed to equality. Uh, which in, in my mind means that uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and there's more work and there's more support and there's more help needed uh, to support uh, women and uh, in this um, particular guys, uh, women's health than, than there is uh, to their male counterparts. With the, uh, with the difference between how much data there is um, in medical testing uh, between women's and men's health, with um, the disparity in understanding of women's health in comparison to male counterparts and there still is a huge amount of work to be to be done um and i think that with, with discussions like this being open and frank and, and all of us working together uh we should have um, a better future for everyone because you know being more familiar with words like menopause periods vaginas Everyone should be just saying these as, as normal words. This should be in our vernacular. These conversations should no longer be happening behind closed doors because women's health is human health and we should all be looking after each other. So I'll step down off my soapbox about this because I've got some people who are far more uh, better versed uh, in this subject itself. So I'm going to pass over initially to Jackie and Sam. They'll intro you, their, themselves to you and go into the presentation they've uh, produced for today. Thanks, guys. Hello. Welcome. Thanks Hello. Hi, I'm going to just try and share the screen and, and we, then we can. OK. And let me see if I can get this to work properly. Uh, OK, Does, can people see that screen OK? Yeah, a little yeah. bit oh, cut off. A little bit cut off. Okay, let me try again. Um, we had it perfect before, guys. We promise. I know. <laughs> Just, <laughs> uh, now I've got. Now you've got all my slides. Okay. Um, presenter view. Oh dear. Sorry. I'm going to stop sharing. Can you remind me how to do it again, please? Sorry. So share. So share, then go to advanced. Yeah, portion of then, the screen. That's correct. And then you are almost there. Just make sure you center it uh, around your um, actual page. So now press on your, yep. And then just move the square to be precisely on the square of the slide. Okay, but now I can't see the notes. Oh, hang on, no, let's move it. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry about this. Um, we're getting some advice to click on slideshows or the one to make sure that uh, you click can see your slideshow. notes. Um, there's a, so the presenter view is, I can't see the where the presenter view is. Mm. Sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm, I wonder if, do you need all the notes or is it something that you can just... Um, okay, I'll just try and talk, talk through yeah, it then. Don't worry about or, that. Me. Okay. Alternatively, maybe Sam, if you have the slides, you could share just the presenter view with the audience and then Jackie, you have access to the notes separately on your screen. I'm not using the notes anyway. I'd try, okay. but Jackie, okay. you, you will be fine. I'm sure we'll Okay, all right. Well, let's let's just go ahead. Can you see the slide now? Um, I can't see the slide. You can't see the slide. Sharing yet. Okay. <laughs> Very sorry about this. Share the screen. 
I'm just glad it's not me with the tech challenges <laughs> because normally it's me. So it's, I, I find it reassuring other people have these challenges too. Okay. That's perfect. We can work with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And is that just a small oh, part, portion of the screen or you can see the whole screen? We can see the whole slide. So I can think see the whole slide. Yeah. Okay. Let's just go ahead then. Sorry. Sorry to sorry about this, everybody. Okay. All right. So um, so my name is Jackie Gordon, uh, technically challenged occupational therapist. Um, and I work at Great Ormond Street Hospital, but I have worked in lots of different back um, places before. And um, uh, so I currently work with children and young people. And Sam? And I am Sam. I'm also a tech um, challenged occupational therapist. Um, I'm also <laughs> co founder of Eco Essex, which is like an online, um, uh, online space really for people to kind of try, try a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, and I'm also a current project leader of um, Love Your Flow Project, which is going out to schools and community groups and running free period workshops. So, yes, it's a, a subject that we're both very passionate about. Yes, okay. So um, and this is now the next challenge is getting onto the next slide, isn't it? Sorry. Okay. So um, we were we wanted to talk about um, menstrual health and sustainable menstrual health and why it's our role as health professionals. So um, a, a bit like. Um, uh, Georgia was saying earlier, menstrual products are menstruation affects half the population, and yet we we still don't talk about it. We still don't see it as a health issue. Um, menstrual products are not provided in the NHS, um, unlike soap and toilet paper, which you'd expect. Um, it, you know, people would be outraged if those weren't provided, and yet menstrual products are not provided. Um, and there's a lack of of period products we know affects access to work, access to education, period pains, and lack of products also impact on physical and mental health and traditional products are hard to use for many people so we feel that this is a really important issue in terms of health um, and the NHS has made a pledge to deliver the world's first net zero health service and respond to climate change improving health now and for future generations so it is something we need to be considering and we need to be thinking about how we promote reusable rather than um, disposable products so Sam, this is your one, I think. This is my bit, okay. <laughs> so when we look at um, how much we use, so menstruation people use on average 11,000 disposable menstrual products um, over their lifetime. And this is generating approximately 200 tonnes of waste a year um, overall. And this is just in the UK. So obviously the stats for worldwide would be ridiculously larger than this. Um, some just randomly interesting facts. Um, a tampon applicator is used approximately for 10 seconds. Um, obviously, if it's made of plastic, and um, as we know, they don't biodegrade um, and they will last forever. Um, another interesting fact for you, if you, can if you buy a standard pack of sanitary pads from the supermarket, the amount of single-use plastic in just one box is the equivalent to five um, plastic bags. So that's how much kind of single-use plastic is in our period pads. And if you was to switch from a disposable method to a menstrual cup, it results in a 99% reduction in your waste compared to single use. So massive reduction in a carbon footprint there by switching. OK, so this one. Um, so this one always shocks people. It shocks me every time I read it, really. So one thing um, about menstrual products is that there is no legal obligation for manufacturers to put on the ingredients. So when we buy skincare or when we buy, um, you know, deodorant, there, there's a legal obligation to write what the ingredients is. On menstrual products, there is no legal obligation. So we, you know, we will assume that what we can buy in supermarkets is therefore safe. What we don't know is that actually, or what we haven't really been told about, is that actually in period products, and I'm talking about um, predominantly here disposable standard off-the-shelf ones, um, where they have synthetic fragrances. Um, the actual, it says here at Cocktail 300 Chemicals, it's actually uh, 3,000. So I've actually, uh, I've done them a favour here, made it look better than it is. It's actually 3,000 chemicals um, and different fragrances. 
Um, and evidence is suggesting that these um, are carcinogens, allergens, irritants, um, and they actually impact and affect our hormones. So these products are in our menstrual products, which we either put against our vulvar skin or even worse, in our body, in our vagina. Um, the cotton that is in the pads as well, so amongst the single-use plastic, there is some element of cotton in these products. Um, and of course, cotton is grown on fields and predominantly, unless it's registered as organic, it is likely to have pesticides on it, which again, we then put that cotton um, tampon, for example, in our vagina. So it is it's quite it's quite shocking. I don't know how other people feel about that. I'd love to see your comments in the chat there about how you find that. Um, and the fact there's no legal obligation to even communicate to us that these these things are in the products that we buy. Um, so, yeah, it really, it really grains on me this. Yeah. OK, on to the next one, Jackie, for me. Thank you. Yep. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to. Um, somebody's walked there, reported about less pain. So, yes. Um, so what, what what they're suggesting is that these um, obviously these chemicals are impacting people's health, and actually when you look at um, people's stories, anecdotal stories, oh, people no. that have um, oh <laughs> I keep chatting anyway, <laughs> people that have really heavy periods, very painful periods, are actually saying that their symptoms are reduced their pain is reduced and their periods are even lighter from the choices that they make from switching away from these chemical induced disposable options. So some really amazing positive stories that I hear from different people. I could talk about that for ages, but obviously we're, you know, we're here just to kind of do a quick overview today. Um, so reusable, there are so many more options out there, as well as disposable options that are better. So there are disposable options that are organic, for example, um, and that don't have plastics in them. So if you still want to use disposable, obviously this is all about choice, but there are better disposable options out there. But I'm going to mainly focus on reusables here. Um, I'm not going to go into depth, in depth about them all, but um, just really just raising your awareness about what is available out there in the real world. Um, don't assume our supermarkets are telling us, you know, all these options. They don't. Um, they take pretty much just give us the disposable options. We're lucky if um, they sell a £25 period pant and hope that we buy it because um, they're not really giving us choices. But there are so many choices out there now, mainly on the Internet, of course. But we have menstrual cups and they've been around for, goodness knows, a couple of decades. Moon Cup yep. was the original. Um, there's a lot. There's about a hundred different types of menstrual cups now, different brands, and they are getting cheaper. I have seen many advertised recently for um, approximately five pounds. So there are offers out there. This can be really, really cheap. The menstrual cup is the most sustainable um, out of the options, which we'll go into a little bit in a minute. Um, but there's also something else called a, a menstrual disc, which is a type of menstrual cup. But you can see this menstrual disc is more of a uh, bowl shape rather than a wine glass shape. I call the menstrual cup the traditional one. The menstrual disc is designed to fit um, under your cervix, really high up um, under your pelvic bone. And it allows for penetrative sex during your period. So it's actually been designed as a very, very similar design as a contraceptive diaphragm. So that's where and how it fits. So if you already have used a diaphragm in the past, this product is going to be very similar, familiar to you. Um, so internal items, those are the couple of internal options. We also have reusable tampons. Um, I have these. These, again, I buy them in organic cotton, so they don't have pesticides. I don't want pesticides in my vagina. Um, and they are literally just material that you roll up and you insert into your vagina and you wash them. I'd put them in a net bag just to wash them. Um, and then there's something called a reusable applicator here, which you could use with the reusable tampon as well if you wanted to. Or you could use that with your own, um, say, disposable tampon, but it saves you having to buy the applicator each time. You can just wash out the reusable applicator. So you're like, at least halving your carbon footprint, even though you might want to use disposable still. And then looking at external items. So if you're somebody that doesn't really want to collect your blood in, internally, you might want to use it and um, collect your blood outside uh, um, externally. Then we've got period pants, which are all the rage at the moment, especially for young people. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit more people with disabilities as well. Um, they just are becoming mainstream now, which is really fantastic. 
and they do range in price. I bought some really lovely organic UK ones for 25 quid each, um, but you can also get them for a fiver from Primark and MS. So, real good range of price, making them affordable, really good for youngsters, very practical for young children that come on the through it's early. And then we have reusable pads, which have been around for a long, long time as well. Again, these are just washable, they just go in the washing machine, very easy to look after. Um, and then lastly, less talked about, um, something called labia pads, which fold up, roll up, and go in your labia. Um, it's very good for people that have sudden gushing and very heavy flow periods. It just helps to do give it like an extra layer of absorbency with whichever option you choose. That's a really quick overview. Period pants are flipping fantastic. If you haven't used them yet, then do investigate them. Um, they are... They come in all different styles. You can see here, there's there's basically a type of period pant for anyone, whatever style you want, thong, lacy, colourful, like black. I know people that don't want to see their blood, so, you know, black is great. All different flows from light to heavy to nighttime. Like, you don't need to worry about whatever your flow is. There are options out there for you. Um, they are just washable. Um, go in the washing machine, dry them, naturally dry them, no tumble dryers, no softeners. Um, and then we have uh, ones that are here. You can see the bottom right picture. There's ones that do up at the side. So depending on what your, um, if you have disability, Sorry. for example, certain things you can't perhaps bend down to put them over your legs, you could do up your pants from the side, for example. Um, and you can see here lots of different styles. So, yeah, Sorry. we love them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Sam, do you want to talk about? So I, I'll just, I'll just, uh, just the reason that um, I put this one in, we're just because um, because people ask about them if they don't know about them, and like I say, uh, like like Sam said, they're mainstream now. They're on a lot of mainstream shops. Um, they've got them in M and S and Primark, and um, and they uh, um, so w and we started using them with kids in the hospital who had. Um, were unable to use traditional products because they couldn't use their hands um, and the ones that do up at the side or the ones that that if they can use one hand so people if anybody who's had a stroke or has got any hand function difficulties or um, disabilities where they as in the previous slide where they have the they have a, a frame on their leg meant that they were still able to um, to manage the, their periods by themselves so um, that was the the so it, it it became an independence issue as well as a, a sustainability issue. I think the good thing about pants is that if you, whatever your, um, if you have got an impairment or disability, you know, because pants are something that we wear anyway, um, you know, it's almost like if you found a way to get dressed and you found a way to manage pants, then you can find a way to manage your period because it's just putting on a pair of pants. Obviously, they've got an extra layer in them. So um, jackets found them really, really useful for people yeah. and different needs. Um, yeah, so the other thing that is really useful to think about, although we are here to talk about mainly about periods, actually reusables are becoming more norm for other needs as well. So we have incontinence, you know, we know incontinence affects, you know, but over a third of women, you know, suffer with incontinence, urine incontinence issues. Um, and it costs, it costs thousands, you know, it can cost so, you can spend thousands of pounds um on conscience wear and it costs the nhs um, i've got all the figures somewhere just it's just 80 i notes. think um it says <laughs> yep it's a, the 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 nhs spends um 80 million pounds a year on on um on disposable uh sanitary products it's like in terms of like pa pads and um and, um 80 million and things 80 million so you can imagine how much waste that is as well mm -hmm. So, you know, there is incontinence pads out there. Um, the pants, for example, could be used for incontinence as well, especially those with light bladder weakness. I'm not necessarily talking about people that have real heavy, full urinary incontinence, but those um, with light incontinence, stress incontinence might just need a little backup. Um, these pads and these period pants are there and can be used. And as I say, they are much more affordable now. Um, there's also things oh, about... Sorry. Like, no, sorry. sorry, I was just going to mention <laughs> about cloth masses, <laughs> toilet training toddlers, um, even pregnancy. You can see there, there's pants that are actually designed for big pregnancy bumps, um, as well as not just females, of course. So there are different um, pants out there as well for, you know, males as well. So, yeah. Oh, and post postpartum bleeding as well. It's a big one. You know, women post post giving birth, you know, there's a lot of a lot of blood and nobody wants to wear those inch thick 
um, <laughs> you know, pads. They are horrible. Those, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and, sorry, sorry you, you talk about okay. this bit. Go on. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to just kind of uh, talk a bit about the carbon impact of menstrual products and average waste per person over a year. This shows the average waste per person over a year. Um, and it sh and it shows the difference between if you, a cup is 0.5 kilograms of CO2 per person per year, um, whereas a tampon or a sandwich pad is between 7.4 and 7.6. There's a huge difference if you're um, using disposable or reusable products. And that takes into consideration the washing, the production, where they come from, all the, all those things. Um, but, but also if you think about the waste, as Sam was saying, and the pictures of the, the, the landfill, if, you, if we're throwing away the waste that goes flushed into the sea and, um, and all those things is, is, is really, really enormous. So if we're thinking about it in terms of um, the average spend over a lifetime as well that's there's that's a huge thing um in terms so if you buy a pair of pants or a cup it can last for five they can last for between three and five years sometimes longer um the the cost that you're of the the amount of products that you're buying is also a huge saving um and if you think about and i was looking up last night the, the carbon impact per per person over over a year um is the same as if we were um driving to scotland and um that's the 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 carbon impact is it of, of us dr driving to scotland or flying to paris so it's quite a bit it's quite a bit from um, london actually in Jackie. from sorry i'm sorry yes <laughs> sorry. <laughs> i was for me for me for flying from, <laughs> from, from <laughs> flying from london to paris or from flying from london to glasgow um that would be the same as, as the products per year and so if you think about over a lifetime that's quite a lot and in terms of the uh, i i calculated for the hospital it would be the same as forty six thousand um miles um of of uh, flying 46,000 miles that's um, nearly twice around the world as as the impact of the of using reusable products just for just for the young people in our hospital so there are lots of health and sustainability benefits. We've talked a bit about um, increasing independence and dignity. So the project I was doing, the, ch the young people gave feedback. We had an, we still have an ongoing um, questionnaire and people saying that they feel really good not having to ask their mum to help and uh, carers saying it's a complete game changer because they don't have to get involved. Um, and other people saying that they thought they would be horrible, but actually really comfortable. So it empowers people. And I think we need to empower people to know that they have the choice and the knowledge that, as Sam was saying, all the products that are out there um, and reducing disposable project. Um, protection means you get less plastic, decreased waste, the cost of waste for the NHS in terms of um, taking the bins away block toilets and then there's a lifelong benefit it's a really important point about the reduced cost the reduced period poverty um average some people spend about 120 pounds a year on disposable products which is a which is about five thousand pounds over a lifetime it's a lot of money um and also as uh, in terms of period poverty uh, enabling people to go to school to go to work to thinking about the things that that um young people are missing out on because they because of them not having appropriate period products sam do you want to talk about this one yeah so we were kind of thinking what can we do you know as health professionals for example um, and we were thinking about all the things that actually we do have some control over things that we can do so um, we want to increase patients' awareness of choices. So the first thing, as people have said in the chat here, is that we do need to raise awareness of just actually telling people that actually there's more out there than just uh, disposable pads and disposable tampons. So it's kind of talking about this more, reducing taboo about this subject. So um, Jackie will tell you, I'm sure, about what they did at Great Ormond Street, but like they, they you know, you add this kind of topic to our forms. I mean, I've been working for 20 years in the NHS, and I'm not sure I've ever seen on any of the assessment forms, um, how are you managing your periods? Um, you know, are, are your periods okay? Anything actually makes this a normal topic. You know, it affects 50% of the population. It's almost like we're ignoring it and not actually bringing it up. Um, so we want to see it um, introduced more into clinical forms um, and part of our assessments. So we also want to look at things like educating people on the facts. So in whatever area of work we are in, we could be um, we could be midwives talking to women about postpartum bleeding. 
we could be um, a health visitor supporting uh, toddlers with you know toilet training uh, whatever it is women's health sexual health clinics, whatever area we're working we want to look at having resources available to, to support people so we can give them choices so we're not only raising awareness about it we want to give them facts so look at what resources you could direct people to that are near you are there local campaigns local charities are there you know are there um, local authority near you giving out vouchers or freebies so looking at what is available near you and where you work so you can educate people on the facts and what is available we also want to kind of talk about money so although money isn't directly um, health related when we look at the effects of people living in poverty actually we know like period poverty exists so people have to choose between uh, period products or food you know we know a lot of people um, will put their period choices second you know they will put rather put food on the table for you know their family or you know pay for heating so we know there is a direct impact with our health and how much money we have um so you know talk about money how are people managing their periods when it costs so much money over a whole lifetime as jackie said it's about 120 a year over a whole lifetime it's, it works out on average five thousand pounds extra that a menstruating person has to find compared to a non-menstruating person um, so, you know, we want to say to people, not only is this good for the planet, actually, you will save hundreds, if not thousands of pounds over your lifetime by making people aware of that. Um, and we want to inform people. So um, for those, especially those young people that are coming in. The trauma, um, sorry, have trauma based uh, after surgery, they will get trauma induced periods. Jackie will explain it more. I'm sure you can explain that um oh just to say that anesthet anesthetics often yeah. often induce periods and people don't always know that and so they may not be prepared when they come into hospital yeah so it's a subject that we you know it's making people aware of that that actually that could happen and are you prepared for that if you're having surgery are you prepared for your periods you know may um, be induced for example um and then we want to look at the um future goals you know the nhs is long term um jackie wrote at the right at the very beginning um, when it said about the NHS's goal, it wasn't just around producing, um, you know, it wasn't about supporting people's health right now. It also mentions about future generational health as well. So by our choices today, they have an environmental impact and health implications, which will affect, um, you know, our children and our children's generation. So it's thinking about actually talking about reusables um, today will reduce landfill, you know, reduce um, excess water in the production of uh, products, for example. And that will impact and have a positive impact on future generations' health if we can make these changes. So thank you very much for listening to us. Um, this QR code here, I, don't, I think, I don't know if you're sharing the slides afterwards. I'm happy to share slides if, I don't know if Sam, you, you are. But um, if anybody wants to, to click on this QR code and fill in our questionnaire about period products, we're trying to get as many people as possible to talk about it, uh, to get some inf to get some more um, um, evidence and data behind wh whether it's something that people would like um, provided by the NHS. So. Thank you very much for your time. That's amazing. Thank you, guys. And we'll post that QR code out on our social media as well so that people are able to take that. As much data as you can get as possible is really important. Um, some super, super interesting things, you know, around the toxic chemicals. Didn't really ever think about that personally. I don't know how many people do. A very small amount, I'm sure. Um, amazing that things like period pants are now in places like Primark. Um, they're there on the shelf in front of everyone for everyone to see. I remember my mum saying when she was younger, she used to go to the village shop to have to get her um, period products and um, they would wrap them up in newspaper and put it in a bag as if it was a fish because it was so embarrassing. It must be so terrible to just be walking around with a box of tampons because it was just so taboo. Um, and now period pants are there in Primark and you're taking them off the shelf and it's like, yes, this is a product I'm getting. It's my health. Why is it even a question? Why is it? Why should it even be a hidden conversation? Um, what, what's also awesome is what I've seen um, is at festivals. 
Um, and I know it's like, I, I feel like it's a responsibility for everyone to be having these conversations, not just those in healthcare, not just people who are uh, midwives or people who just, it's their job to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I notice there's a lot of um, menstrual cup stuff happening at festivals mm -hmm. because oh, festival periods is not the one, right? <laughs> and um, dealing with like... Um, a single use product at festivals is like come on you've got another million things to worry about uh, so I've seen a lot of like uh, moon cup and other um, products being advertising like free stuff at places like Glastonbury so I think let's try and push for for places like that where you know that a period is going to be a terrible thing to have during that thing. you know times like exam times you know um, at school and stuff like that we should be thinking about supplying or, or just making awareness of these um, alternatives so um, anyways I'm going to move straight on if you can stop sharing please Jackie and we'll move straight on to Emil um, and she's going to talk um, about the amazing things um, that those guys are doing um, at uh, Samphire Neuroscience and this is going to be something that I think is a little bit further past my own uh, understanding of science so really excited to, to introduce you Emil. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. And thanks so much for such a wonderful uh, presentation, Jackie and Sam, I think. I honestly echo a lot of what uh, Georgia said and a lot of what you guys said. Like, it's just one very shocking where women's health is, even with regards to basic hygiene. And, you know, as I will talk about basic care as well. But also, I think it's very important to recognize how much innovation is happening in London and around London, especially in the space. So um, I'm coming from a bit of a different background, which I'll share in a second. But I think companies like Day and Dame Health are working really hard on getting themselves certified on a lot of those, you know, kind of um, quality management systems and showing to women that they actually care a lot about the toxins that are being put in there, about the research that needs to be done about those products and their long-term effects as well. So I'm really excited to, you know, be based in London and be around uh, a lot of these women's health-focused companies um, that are building a lot in the space. Um, but regardless, I'm very excited to be here today. Thanks so much for having me. Um, especially because I think I'll take a bit of a different angle to sustainability to Jackie and Sam's, but very much in the same direction. So as I alluded to a bit earlier, my name is M. I was born and raised in Lithuania, uh, which is why it is Emile on the screen, but I tried to go by M. It makes everyone's lives easier. Um, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Samphire Neuroscience, where we're building solutions for neglected women's health needs, specifically menstrual pain and PMS and premenstrual depression. Um, so we feel that in the field of women's mental health, it has been ignored for way too long, and we're building solutions there that I'm going to ch chat about in a second. But my background kind of fittingly is in neuroscience, and I was always very fascinated about the way that you know, so much of our brain explains the way we feel about the world around us, the way we think, the way we make decisions. Um, and yet women's brains have been consistently understudied and underserved in the solution space as well. So uh, I'm excited to share a bit more about how we're doing it. So throughout the presentation, the main way that we think about sustainability is about how can we ensure that women's journey through healthcare is one that is healthy, sustainable in terms of the products that they use, but also longer term. So to us, women's individual decisions have to take sustainability into consideration, but also it's about their long-term plans as well. Like if a woman has solutions that work well for her, she will not need to go in to see the doctor as much. And at the moment, we know that a lot of interactions between women and doctors are actually not very effective. Uh, our research shows, and you know, this is kind of well-known information that a lot of women are disappointed uh, by their interactions with doctors. They feel that they're unheard and they feel that their kind of needs are not very well fit. And because of that, we feel that if women have solutions that work for them, they will have overall better experiences and improved um, access to the system and healthcare outcomes as well. So to situate you a little bit, though, I think Jackie and Sam already did a lot of like, work in general about menstruation and about uh, kind of menstruation related hygiene as well. Um, so we looked at the trends about in general, how the stigma around menstruation look like. It's obviously something that they touched upon. And I think everyone is very aware of. We look at it from the scientific perspective and something that we see there is that actually interest and the use of words by people and in research has been increasing very much over time in the areas of women's health that had been neglected in the past. So here we see a graph of over time, how many articles, and we're talking here specifically research articles or, you know, kind of a more medical audience as well, have been written about women's specific diseases. So when I use the word dysmenorrhea throughout the presentation, what I mean is menstrual pain. 
It doesn't have any additional meaning. It just means menstrual pain. PMDD stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and that's a severe form of PMS, premenstrual syndrome. PMS stands for PMS, and that's actually not straightforward. Uh, it has about 150 symptoms that uh, women may feel when they have premenstrual syndrome. Most common symptoms are low mood, mood instability, mood shifts, um, irritability, cravings, a lot of things that might be familiar to women. And when they're very severe, they're pre they can be manifested as premenstrual depression. Premenstrual depression is extremely debilitating. It affects about up to 10 women and can lead women suicidal and unable to access the healthcare system. And it's often misdiagnosed because it's women only and it only happens once per month. And a lot of women may not be aware that they have it and they may just call it PMS. Uh, and then menstrual cramps are kind of another way of expressing dysmenorrhea. And I think the reason that is very interesting is if you see um, the graphs on dysmenorrhea and menstrual cramps, a lot of those kind of track together. So we're seeing that a lot of women actually use very medical language to refer to their terms in order to get validity for them. Um, so they would maybe choose to use the word dysmenorrhea as opposed to cramps if they're writing clinical articles to make it seem more serious. Um, but the important thing that I want to show is that obviously interest by women and by the research community in women's mental and physical health symptoms have been increasing from 2002. Um, you know, it's over 20 years, but it's still very, very low. Like if you look at the numbers published, I'm not including here another graph, but if you look at any other conditions, it's, you know, tens of times more. Um, so even though there's a lot more interest now in women's health, uh, the research is still lagging behind. And I think that's very important because a big part of equality um, and long-term outcomes is by investing and research in the area. And so we know that globally about 1.5 billion women have menstrual pain. Um, that probably doesn't surprise anyone. About a, between 80 and 90% of women will have menstrual pain every single period. We expect about a third of that to be uh, women who have debilitating menstrual pain. Globally, we expect about 800 million women to live with premenstrual syndrome, um, and a portion of them live with PMDD, the premenstrual uh, dysphoric disorder. And in fact, now we've been in operation for a bit over two years, and the numbers of women with PMDD that we have found across London and the UK is really staggering. And those are women that have been extremely uh, disappointed in the healthcare system in the past. So we find it very important to talk about that with healthcare stakeholders throughout. Um, one of the important misconceptions that we find as well is that menstrual health is mental health. Oftentimes when people think of menstruation, you know, the things that first come to mind is pads and bleeding and a lot of the stuff that Sam and Jackie were touching upon. Um, and, you know, we're only now progressing towards more innovative solutions in those fields in terms of sustainability, but we are pushing it one step forward. We're saying that, you know, you have to solve the physical concerns around the actual bleeding that happens, et cetera. But also if you look at what women are most annoyed by during their periods, one of them is definitely menstrual pain, but a four out of five of the top five symptoms are actually mental health symptoms. There are symptoms like fatigue, low mood, um, mood irritability, inability, making decisions, et cetera, all things that affect women's ability to perform at work, get promoted, provide supportive care to their children and throughout. So we think that menstrual health is mental health. Um, and we think that too few people have spoken about that in the past. And a lot of the support that women require from healthcare professionals around their menstrual cycles and menstrual health is actually around those mental health aspects. Um, we can delve into that deeper as well during the Q&A. Uh, we also know that the vast majority of women lose productivity. Um, give me just a second. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I wasn't sure if I was hearing a knock. Um, yeah, so the other thing that we know is that almost every woman knows that she loses productivity during this time. So it's not as if, you know, women go through their lives and they have these symptoms and they don't know about them. We know that most of them know they lose productivity. Um, and finally, most women won't talk about it at all. That means that about three quarters of women will, would never tell their experiences to their employer. This is extremely important because if we know that four out of five symptoms are mental, most women lose productivity and they never tell their boss, then the excuse of, oh, my you know, employees don't experience it no longer works um, because we know that they wouldn't know about it anyway. And we think it's important to talk about. 
This is just a brief overview about the different solutions that women may have to address their premenstrual syndrome as well as pain symptoms. So this ranges from, you know, very experimental procedures that are not necessarily scientifically proven to like a lot of supplements are, um, to a lot of very, you know, almost too invasive um, pharmaceutical solutions like pain relief and analgesics. And I believe Jackie was mentioning it that oftentimes a lot of analgesia can actually stimulate menstrual bleeding as well. So a lot of these have side effects that women are unhappy about. So a lot of the things that we work about is by providing non-invasive solutions that do not interact with their underlying biology so that we could achieve more kind of inclusive solutions for these needs and menstrual health care. So for us, we asked ourselves the question, what if women had access for these concerns to long-term non-invasive wearable and at-home care, which would essentially be able to deliver better solutions in an at-home setting that are medically proven um, and recommended uh, by their NHS doctor, which we think is very critical to pushing this needle a bit forward to providing women with the care they need. So because of this, over the last two years, we've been building the Samphire hairband. Um, again, we're not yet on the market. We plan to be in early 2024, but we hope that this makes you excited for what's to come. We're currently going through medical device approvals, and this is a very well-researched device building on 30 plus years of neurotechnological research. So this is a medical device, as I mentioned, and it comes with a digital companion. It's extremely easy to use. The digital de the device itself has only one button and you put it on the brain and it stimulates two parts of your brain um, with again, very well validated methods that allow for um, the relief of PMS and menstrual pain symptoms. So the way that we achieve the relief of PMS symptoms is essentially by equilibrating the activity between the two brain hemispheres, uh, which is the same inactivity that we see actually in patients with depression. So we use the same methodology there. Um, and then we um, stimulate another part of the brain to achieve pain relief by increasing the pain perception threshold. So even though it feels like, you know, you're experiencing menstrual pain, we make your pain ignore those symptoms and therefore me make it more manageable. It targets, again, all of these symptoms. Um, you wear it for 20 minutes a day for seven days a month. So seven days, so five days before your period and the first two days of your period. And in fact, we see a lot of popularity among endometriosis patients who are the ones who experience not only extremely heavy bleeding, but also extreme menstrual pain. So being able to help their minds to um, be more resilient to that pain is really important. Um, it is our proprietary technology. We're building on a lot of uh, other research in the space, but it is unique to women. We built it specifically for women. We built it to look like something that women could wear relatively inconspicuously in at-home settings and focus specifically on their needs. So definitely the pain and mood. Uh, and this technology has been used in the field of depression treatment for over 20 years. Uh, it's used in pain management, like chronic pain management as well, uh, but has never been made into a device specifically for women or something that is um, easy, user-friendly, and for both of these concerns as well. Um, and over time, we learn from you know, your own specific needs. Again, PMS has 150 plus symptoms, and we know that a woman who experiences fatigue may be very different from a woman who experiences low mood. And so by seeing their changes over time, we're able to narrow it down and make it the most effective for them. We know that medical devices are extremely important in the female technology world. So actually a lot of the innovation happening in the women's technology field specifically is around menstrual hygienic products. So it's a lot around, you know, what, uh, again, Sam and Jackie were speaking about earlier. It's about how can you, let's say, put cannabis inside um, inside tampons and make them therefore re remove some pain, et cetera. But a lot of the innovation also happens in the technological and device space. And we think it's very important that women have access to a whole range of solutions. To us, it's about providing optionality for these um, for these needs. And so the way that we will work is that we will be selling the device and it will come with a companion that's part of the full solution. That's very good because one of our key focus is to integrate very easily into the healthcare system. Um, so women are able to export any data tracking that they do on our app and show it to their gynecological expert, whether that's their doctor, their GP, and therefore be able to get the diagnosis, whether that's dysmenorrhea, whether that's endometriosis, whether that's premenstrual depression. To us, that was always very critical because we want to make sure that at the moment we see a lot of women using different apps for menstrual tracking and then not trusting their doctors throughout. And we really want to bridge that gap. And we believe that by providing a solution that works and that helps to women understand their own bodies, uh, we have to bridge it in a way that makes sense to doctors as well. And we think that some of it will go directly to consumers because we see a lot of demand from women, uh, but we also do really want to be championed by doctors um, because we are medically led, medically driven and approved, um, and we're just a very new solution in a field that currently hasn't had many before. 
it's a bit of our, our progress. Um, I think importantly, this is our team. Uh, we work with um, a fully London-based team. A lot of our advisors come from top leading hospitals in the US where they have focused on women's needs for years. Um, and we have built it specifically with women in mind. So we're very excited to share it. And yeah, I'm very excited to invite you all to collaborate with Samfire to improve women's quality of life and access to solutions. Um, always feel free to reach out to learn more and yeah, happy to delve into the Q&A. Um, I know this is a an overview and this sounds like a very new solution, but we think it's, we're very grateful for the invitation to join you all here because we think that it's very important for NHS stakeholders to know what's to come and where women's health is heading and how it can bridge the gap towards the future as well. Thanks so much for that presentation. It was really, really good. Um, I know that Jackie actually already has a question that she has posed for you um, from one panelist to another. So we can start off with that one. Do you want to just sit, ask that vocally, Jackie? Um, yeah, thank you very much. And that's that's really exciting. I think it's really exciting to have an app that tracks everything so that you have the data to and you can keep track of it when you're speaking to a doctor. Um, but um, just wonder what the band looks like. And is it a little bit like a functional electrical some stimulation thing or is it um like the fes that you get for back pain and um pregnancy that's exactly right yeah thank okay. you very much for the question um so the hairband looks pretty much exactly as i was showing it on the slide deck so i'm just going to bring it back up i this think is we exactly did what it, oh sorry we, we didn't we you we'd stopped at one slide we didn't see all the rest of the slides um oh seriously yeah we just <laughs> thought that you were talking through um, oh, which slide great. did you stop on? <laughs> which one did we stop at? If we um, go back. Did you see this one? No. No, no. Oh my God. So I was talking to myself. Gorgeous. Okay. Um, <laughs> that one. We, we know, stopped, you, stopped there. We saw this one. Oh, okay. Great. Well, anyway. It was great information. We all took it in without the. Yeah. Um, <laughs> without the cue but uh... well you guys were a very polite audience anyway um <laughs> this is what the hairband looks like so thank you very much for your question jackie this is exactly what the hairband looks like uh this is a bit of an older model so the newer model is a bit thinner um based on kind of women's feedback of like they would like to, to look even more inconspicuous uh, but yeah that's what it looks like that's the the broad uh mood of the app and we're constantly iterating constantly looking for feedback we're working a lot alongside doctors as well so yeah, as I mentioned, the 20 minute session, and that's what it looks like. Um, I'll just look at other slides that might be interesting. Um, yep, we spoke through that, the fact that there's an app that comes with it that integrates with doctor's needs. Um, and then that was our team as well. Um, but yeah, I, I might just leave it on the on the hairband and how it looks like. And then to your other question, Jackie. So yes, it exactly. It uses electrical stimulation. I think if you have experience using, you know, functional electric stimulation or uh, transcutaneous electric stimulation, TENS, because um, a lot of people use TENS for menstrual pain on their ovaries, it is the same mode of action because it uses electricity, but because we operate at the brain, we can get that higher level effect. So let's say if you put something on the muscle, you achieve muscle pain relief, but it doesn't work for mood. It doesn't work for uh, depression, et cetera. So by putting it on the head and essentially affecting the signals more top up, uh, we're able to affect both mood and pain as well. So we're kind of affecting it at a higher level um, of efficacy. But I do think that especially in the physical therapist world, and actually a lot of our research is led by physical therapists, um, who own the, the patient journeys and who see a lot of that struggle, um, then I think, yeah, the mechanism of action is most similar to that. Thank you very much. That's really, really fantastic. And we love to see tech leading the way um, at sustainability partnerships. We do a lot of uh, events with uh, speakers who are doing cutting edge stuff. But um, and I know that like a lot of people are using apps like Flow, for example. Um, apps are kind of more um, commonplace, I would think, for for period tracking. Some people um, use apps for uh, fertility and that kind of stuff as well. And it is way more commonplace for, for people to be using tech to augment um, their understanding of their cycles um but I think that I mean the word femtech is problematic in my mind anyway because it's just tech why does it have to be femtech um like, I mean this event in itself why does it have to be women's health it's health um but there are also questions that always get asked when it comes to uh, femtech. Um, and we were talking about period po poverty earlier, um, and it's about the accessibility. And I know it's a tough question. I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there is always that kind of, you know, 
do we have to worry about those people if you can't afford a tampon you can't afford a hairband do you know what I mean so just want to know um if, if there's anything that you guys are doing to work with um people who aren't necessarily going to be able to have access to this type of device absolutely and I think that's uh you're not at all putting me on the spot. It's one of the most important things that we deal with because uh, you're totally right. Period poverty is absolutely right. And we are talking to a relatively developed country's audience, et cetera. So the way we are addressing it is one, being aware of these things. And two is that's why our big kind of motivation and work stream is to become reimbursable. Uh, like we think that, you know, we should be the most boring hairband that one ever owns. Like, you know, if you're a woman who menstruates and experiences pain and mood complaints, you should be able to access it free of charge from the government and that's why we're here that's why we want to work with the nhs because we could easily just go to people market it and sell it to you know rich women who feel like it affects their performance at work which you know is definitely a strategy we will take in the beginning because we do want to make sure that we collect enough data to show the efficacy but our long-term plan is that it's part of your health care and as you say it's not part of women's health care it's just part of need because the way we currently speak about premenstrual syndrome and premenstrual depression is the way we spoke about depression 20 years ago 20 years ago we were like oh if you're depressed it's your own fault we don't need solutions now we say that depression is a mental health issue and yet we still say that pms is like you know, everyone does that, you know, just deal with it. So I think that there's going to be a massive shift there. And, you know, reimbursability is our main way for access. But the other thing that I don't want to ignore is the fact that a lot of technology is usually designed for the average consumer, which we all know is a man, um, and then adapted for women. Whereas we took a very different approach in the field of neurotechnology, because we were like, no, women are our only consumer, or, you know, everyone assigned female at birth, uh, and who experiences these symptoms. And because of that, we actually worked with women with different hairstyles, which wasn't actually something studied in neurotechnology. And a lot of this technology doesn't work for women with, let's say, uh, you know, larger hairstyles or thicker hair or curlier hair, uh, which is not necessarily, you know, the most popular hairstyle on the earth. Um, so we've worked a lot on making sure that our design is inclusive beyond the actual device price and accessibility um, and beyond. And I guess the last thing that I'll say, which is more of like, you know, personal opinion and personal drives and et cetera. And something that really excites me is you know, I, I, I thought a lot about period poverty and throughout, especially because I meet a lot of founders building sustainable period products, uh, you know, the founders of Day and Dame, they are in my communities and I speak to them all the time and they've asked me that question as well. And where I get to is that a lot of the technology has usually been developed for a lot of technology development drives priorities for the future. And then it kind of goes to be accessible to everyone. And I think that if we don't drive the top level for women's health research and technology, like if women don't have the most cutting edge solution in neurotechnology, which, you know, this should be, it's not like men have some solution that uses neurotechnology or et cetera. Then I think it trickles down to other areas of women's health, because if people and other industries can see that women are very open-minded to technology, which, you know, one of the slides that didn't show demonstrates that women are very excited about buying medical technology. If we can show that women are exciting about, excited about buying women first technology, and you know, I know we're still speaking about developed countries, then I actually think it encourages a lot more businesses to develop around creating for women at different levels as well. So I think it's about driving that top line as well and showing that top level research, top level products, top level technology can be women first. Um, yeah, and just paving the way through that. We are not trying to solve all of women's problems. We want to solve one and, you know, kind of expand from there. And um, because of that, we lead with what we know best, which is cutting edge technology. And we just don't accept the fact that, um, you know, women will not be interested because there's a lot of uh, other problems that are unsolved in the space. But that's a super important question. Um, and we think about that a lot. Awesome. And I I noticed on your slide, you had a black woman wearing the headband as well, because we talk about the disparity of information around women's health in comparison to men. But then when we look at the disparity of information um, of women from um, any uh, ethnic minority background in comparison to, to, to white people, again, there's, there's that huge gap. So it's great to see that you guys are thinking not just inclusively of, OK, it needs to be women first. It needs to be women of, of any type of background background because their physiology is completely different and we can't just say a white woman's data is the same for, for every single other background so it's great to see that you're concerned for sure and 
For sure. And I think you're actually bringing another point, which is that Black women in particular across kind of different countries are more likely to have endometriosis and uterine fibroids as well. And they tend to be underdiagnosed by their usually white doctors who are not aware of both the prevalence and, you know, in general, that whole trend of ignoring women's complaints. And actually, that's the reason why we say that we're a symptom treatment. We address menstrual pain and menstrual mood symptoms that are associated with these clinical diagnoses, but not necessarily, because we realize that a lot of women may know that they have menstrual pain, but they may not know that it's because of endometriosis or it's because of uterine fibroids. And because we're a drug-free thing and hormone-free, we do not interact with our internal bodies. And so we're not, you know, uh, interfering in any way with that process. And we think it's actually to bridge that informational gap where a lot of women may know the symptom, but may not know the cause, uh, which is, of course, um, socioeconomic status dependent and background. Um, I've got a couple of minutes left and um, Jackie I just wanted to ask you obviously working at one of the most famous hospitals in the country where we all know amazing work is done uh, especially for young people um, would you be able to give us sort of a I don't know how long that you've been working there for but maybe over the time that you have been there something that's made you feel like um, that, that the needle is sort of changing a little bit towards especially young women young girls um uh, sexual health or physical health and, and something that you've said you come in and thought oh, that's really made my heart feel a little bit better about this situation uh, in your work um oh gosh uh, well uh, well <laughs> you on the spot as well that's what I'm here for that's all right um well as as Sam was saying you know we have now changed our website you know we now have uh, information about sustainable products on the website so anybody who goes to look up menstrual health on the website will get or about periods or looking at any of that will get information about sustainable products so that's that's been something I've been really pleased that we're kind of like championing and it's all and we're also um giving out I've had lots of people come and ask me because I've put stuff on all the toilet doors about about different products and things so we have lots of different um people come and ask me staff of our staff as well as as well as um families um and i think young people are much uh, i think young women are much um more ready to talk about their about their periods and much more ready to talk about um their own bodies and how they're affected than the than certainly my my school friends were when I was at school in terms of like being open about it and being happy to talk to it. and I think that also the prompting prompting then all the patients who come in now for a any kind of operation um, are asked about their period so we the, the, the stupid anomaly was that with that anybody over the age of uh, 10 and when they come in for an operation has a has to have a pregnancy test to make sure they're not pregnant um, but we didn't ask them about their periods so now they're asking everybody about their periods and how they manage them and how they're going to manage them while they're in hospital so those things are starting to become much more mainstream and I think that that's as as Em said you know we we need to be pushing forward with this and kind of like recognizing that it's just part of health that's amazing. Um, yeah. I mean, even when I went to school, it wasn't commonplace to talk about what was happening to you. You were just really sad and in pain and you just had to deal with it. Um, but we have come a long way from um, tampons being wrapped up in newspaper and smuggled out of the back door of a shop. So um, yeah. I really, really, and I love to see it for the next generation yeah. of, of, of girls. Um, and again, the, the tech that they, they now have access to and and just the, the conversation just being so much more open, honest and having uh, it not just be a female conversation you know I've got Nathan here who I know has he's asked a lot of questions be be inquisitive you know don't feel like it's not your place to ask don't feel like it's not your place to care um but any of the the male um people we have on the uh, on the sh um webinar as well it's not it's not our conversation it's it's everyone's conversation it's everyone's concern um and that was the whole point of, of running this event today so I, I've, I have run out of time I did need to tell everyone about events that we have coming up so I'm quickly going to say uh 29th of March at the end of this month we do have um a health tech specific event um we, we then have Earth Day on the 21st of April that we're going to be running an event about around investing in our planet and then another favorite one of mine on the 24th of May, we're going to have an event around how green is your data. So um, some really good um, events coming up um, on our list this year. But um, uh, as we've uh, just run out of time there, thank you so much to everyone who's come um, and uh, participated. And <laughs> um, really loved everyone's questions. We really loved it. Everyone's always so um 
open to, to, to asking questions and to, to getting involved with the conversation. Thank you so much to um, our speakers that we've had on today as well. Um, really appreciate you giving up your time um, to share. Cannot wait to see this hairband on the market this time next year. Uh, please do keep in touch with us as well and send us an, uh, you know updates on what's happening with that. We'll be more than happy to share. Uh, Jackie, thank you so much to yourself and I know Sam had to go as well. So thanks so much for your time as always. Thank you to, uh, to Nathan, my co-founder. Um, have an amazing rest of your international Women's Day, do something great to to tell your uh, your your uh, female colleagues and uh, your your allies. Uh, thanks for being around. Thanks for the support. Um, and we'll see you guys next time.